Hello, welcome to A Bridge Forward. My name is Jim Baltzer, I'll be your host. Today we'll be talking about executive clemency petitions, sealing of criminal records. And my guest today is uh, the distinguished Ina Silverglide, and she'll be answering questions relating to uh, what's involved in seeking and requesting executive clemency or how to go about sealing your criminal record uh, in, in an effort to uh, get a fresh start. Ms. Silverglide, welcome. Thank you. Okay, uh, so can you tell us a little bit about yourself? You're, you're an attorney and you specialize and focus on clemency petitions and uh, helping people seal their, their records. Yes, uh, so I've been an attorney since 1990. Um, the first half of my legal career, I focused on employment law issues. And then since 2009, I've been working with individuals who have criminal background issues. Okay. Um, so I sort of segued away from employment law to helping people find employment by eliminating their criminal backgrounds. Okay. What is the difference between expunging your record uh, and sealing your record uh, in, in, the, in the legal sense? Um, so most people know the word expungement, but not so much the word sealing. And so Typically, people will come to me and they say, I want to expunge my record. And not everybody can. So the only people who are eligible to expunge their record are people who have not been convicted of a crime. So anyone who has been arrested but never convicted, they can expunge those arrest records. Okay. There are some exceptions to that rule with respect to certain types of convictions. Um, if those convictions are, or the sentence is completed successfully, they are in fact eligible to expunge their record. Uh, a typical example is somebody who's been arrested for the first time for a felony drug offense. Yes. If they're sentenced to something called 710-1410 probation and they complete that probation successfully, that is an expungible case. Okay, so um, expungement would apply where you've been charged with a crime but either you were found not guilty or they now they prost the case, but that still sits there until you have it removed. Would that be a fair statement? That's correct. So a lot of people are under the false impression that if it's been 10 years or if it's been 20 years, that record of that case should just sort of go away. And it doesn't. And it resides in the system until you remove it? Yes. So whenever somebody is convicted of a, uh, yeah, so if, for anyone who's been arrested and convicted of a crime, you have an Illinois State Police record, you have a police record, and you have a court record. Okay. And all of those records will remain in place unless you either petition to expunge that record, which would actually remove the information or seal the record, which removes the record from the public domain, meaning that if you undergo a criminal background check, the record won't be available for a background check company to find and report back to a potential employer. But the actual record will still exist in the Illinois State Police criminal database. Okay. Oh, and then the fourth place where you have, the rec have a record is the FBI. So we have a federal criminal database and we have a state criminal database. So anytime you're arrested, even if you're just arrested for a crime, that, rest, that record will exist in the Illinois State Police criminal database as well as the FBI's database. Okay, and um, in this day and age of uh, background checks, uh, you apply for a position with a company and you've had this information expunged or, or sealed, um, as the case may be, and yet the reporting agency reports on that information. Uh, is, is there some civil liability for the reporting agency for doing that? Yes, there is. And part of the problem, the way the system is set up, is we have a state law, for example, that says employers cannot consider, consider arrest records. They can only consider criminal, uh, they can only consider conviction records. Conviction. But the criminal background check company, which we refer to as criminal reporting agencies, CRAs, they are not regulated by state law. They're only regulated by federal law, the Fair Credit Reporting Act. Okay. So 
it falls under that category. Right. So what happens is, and it's a, unfortunately a common occurrence. I, I just had somebody question me about it earlier this week. Somebody applied for a job. They're offered a job. That job offer is typically contingent on a criminal background check, passing a criminal background check. This person had an arrest record, didn't have a conviction record. But when the background report came back, it inferred that he had a criminal record because he'd been arrested. And the job offer was pulled. Or they, all things being equal, there were two candidates and they, one didn't have that and the other did. So they, maybe they didn't even tell him that. They just selected the other candidate. But going back to your, your, your question, what can happen, because it's not a perfect world, if you seal your record in January and you, uh, you go on a job interview, you're offered a job in July, if the criminal background check company is relying on a database of information that is old, that sealed record may get reported because the database they're, they're relying on still has that record in it. Okay. It's the obligation of the background check company, based on the Fair Credit Reporting Act, that they have an obligation to rely on the most current information. So if you, in fact, had a record that was sealed in January and it pops up on a background check in July, you have a cause of action against that background check company because they have failed to comply with their obligation to rely on the most current database of information. Okay. That doesn't mean you're going to save the job. Um, in most cases, employers, you know, once they get the information, they pull the job offer, they're on to the next job candidate. Though every once in a while you have an employer who will actually listen to what you have to say and will go ahead and hire you. But unfortunately, more often than not, it doesn't happen that way. Okay. So Illinois had recently passed a law allowing for sealing of records. And what type of records can one have sealed? And what type of records will, will not seal? Um, so Illinois, when I started doing this work in 2009, the records that were eligible for sealing were largely nonviolent misdemeanor convictions. So your retail theft, theft, criminal trespass, uh, you know, damage to property, rec not reckless conduct. Um, uh, what's, I always forget that one type of, it's another low level offense. Those were, those were sealable convictions. And then the only sealable felony well, it's really expungeable, is that 710, 1410 probationable offense and class four pro prostitution. Those are the only sealable crimes. And then a couple of years ago, they, in, they widened the, uh, the scope of what was sealable to include battery, ag assault, um, could that be separate from domestic relations or not? No. Okay. I, I just bring that up because... Yeah, so there are two ways that somebody can be charged with battery, which is technically a low-level crime. If you get into a scuffle with somebody in a bar yes. and nobody gets seriously hurt except maybe your ego, um, that you're going to be charged with misdemeanor, misdemeanor battery. If, however you have that same bar fight with your girlfriend or your brother, they're going to charge you with misdemeanor domestic battery. There is a huge difference between the two offenses for purposes of can you seal this crime. Yes. And the bottom line is even today, even though there was a huge expansion of the list of sealable offenses going into this year, um, domestic battery, whether it's a misdemeanor or a felony, remains not sealable. Okay. It, as far as, let's take traffic, uh, which could consist of speeding or uh, uh, DUI, uh, you want to get a job with Lyft or Uber, is that something you can seal or expunge or? Uh, so f for the most part, anybody who's been convicted of a DUI or receive something called supervision, which technically is not a conviction, but you plead guilty, 
in order to get sentenced to supervision. Neither of those, so the, the person who's actually convicted of DUI, a DUI, or received supervision, they can neither expunge or seal that record. Okay. The same goes for reckless driving, with one exception that if you commit the crime of reckless driving, I think before you turn 25, you can seal that offense, but that's the only exception. Well, let's say you're driving recklessly, you get charged, and you were trying to get your wife to the hospital to have a baby. <laughs> you have to hope that you have a, a really um, a really nice police officer <laughs> who's willing to charge you with something other than reckless driving if you're over the age of 25. Okay. Uh, this process, how would it affect somebody that's in the healthcare industry or healthcare information industry? What are their options? Because my understanding is if you have uh, certain convictions that it would preclude you or exclude you, um, it, perhaps in your education or otherwise. Um, from so healthcare as well as a handful of other fields, whether you have something on your record is obviously going to impact whether you're somebody that can work in that industry. Um, with respect to health care, normally if you have certain types of convictions, depending on whether you're going into the field as a licensed professional or a non-licensed professional, there are different ways of addressing the fact that you have something on your background. So for example, if you get certified as a CNA, that's not a licensed position in healthcare. It's a it's a position where you get some you get a cert you get a certification. If you have let's say you, you you've committed the crime of retail theft, if you don't seal that conviction, which frankly there's no reason why you wouldn't unless you couldn't because it was a recent case and you have a waiting period to seal, the only way an, a healthcare employer can hire you is if you were to apply for a healthcare worker waiver from the Illinois Department of Public Health. Okay. Otherwise, that healthcare provider will be told by the Illinois Department of Public Health, this person is not employable. Okay. So it's very important that people, if they've ever had an incident, to check that it's, whether that's still on their record or not. There's clearly a lot of people out there who are walking around with arrest records and probably more importantly, conviction records that now can be sealed. Okay. Especially in light of the, the bill that was w signed into law by the governor at the, in, at the end of August of last year. How did that expand the rights uh, in this situation? Significantly. In what areas? Um... Largely with respect to felonies. Okay. So as I indicated, when I started this, when I started doing this work in 2009, the only felonies that were subject to removal were class four, felony class four prostitution, which has now been downgraded to a misdemeanor, and class four possession of a controlled substance, which is typically the only way you're eligible to be sentenced to 710, 14, 10 probation. Um, then a couple years after that, they expanded the list of sealable offense, sealable felony, in fact, sealable felony offenses That's to include, <laughs> to include class three and four theft, class three and four retail theft, class three and four um, forgery, class three and four theft by deception, and class four possession of burglary tools. Okay. So that was a fairly significant expansion at the time. But that still left a lot of people unable to, you know, to seal their record. This most recent expansion is greater than I ever thought I would see, certainly as soon as it happened. So today we talk about not so much what is sealable, but what isn't. Okay. Because we have opened the doors to the vast majority of crimes with the exception of Unfortunately, DUIs and reckless, drivings, dri reckless driving convictions are still not eligible. Domestic battery, any kind of domestic offense, including violation of an order of protection, uh, those remain off limits. Any crime that subjects somebody to registration as a sex offender, okay. 
and there's another registry for violent offenders. As long as you're on that registry, which I believe has 10-year registration requirements, I don't believe they have lifetime registration requirements like the sex offender registry. Once you're off the violent offender registry, your offenses is subject to sealing. Okay. So that means today any felony drug offense is sealable. Doesn't matter if it's a class one, a class X, a class two, they're all eligible. Uh, also eligible is burglary, residential burglary, arson, arson, murder, manslaughter. They're all eligible. Okay, at, at, at some point. I have, in fact, since the law changed, I got clemency, not clemency, excuse me, I got sealing for a young woman who was initially charged with murder, not because she was the person that shot the gun that killed somebody, but because she was somehow an accomplice. She was after, in the car. She wasn't even in the car. She wasn't even there. Uh, but she was originally charged with murder and ultimately pled guilty to aggravated discharge of a firearm. And she was granted sealing on that charge. Okay. Um, firearms, um, how would this affect somebody that is trying to, what, you're trying to get your FOID card either reinstated or get a new one or get one. How would that affect, uh, how does this program, I'll call it, affect those rights uh, in, under the circumstances? So sealing a record has no bearing whatsoever on somebody trying to reinstate their FOIA card rights. There are apparently some attorneys out there that are telling people that that will help them get their FOIA card. That will absolutely not help them get their FOIA card. That's not to discourage somebody from petitioning to seal their record, but if what they really want, let's say this person is self-employed, so they don't have to worry about whether or not they can pass a background check, but they'd really like to have a FOIA card because they maybe they have a brick and mortar storefront and they want to be able to protect themselves. Sure. But if they have a felony conviction or they have a domestic battery conviction or they have a violation of an order of protection conviction, the only way they can reinstate their FOIA card rights if it's been a case that's less than 20 years old is to petition for clemency. Okay. And because the governor has the authority to reinstate any rights that you have had taken from you as a result of a conviction. And that's usually in the context of a felony um, as opposed to domestic battery. So in other words, uh, there's a 20 year wait of, with certain ex with exceptions. There's, what there is is there is a, a state law that says if you've, if it's been more than 20 years since you completed your sentence on a felony charge, you can petition a court, a state court judge, to order the, the Illinois State Police to issue you a FOID card. So it only applies to those individuals whose cases are basically 20 years old. Okay. And somebody who has their record either expunged or sealed or they get clemency and they're asked, uh, their employer later finds out that they said no when asked the question, what are the implications? Um, attended upon that. Um, you, you have this expungement, you have this sealing, but technically they say were you ever convicted of and it, it's a little in your mind you're thinking well gee what do I say because I'm done with it, it's sealed, but then they're asking you and you do you say yes or no? I mean, So one of the benefits of expunging or sealing your record is that once that happens you do not have to indicate that you have a record. So the statute, the state statute says, once your record is expunged or sealed, you are not obligated to disclose that you had a record at one time. Now in Illinois, employers are not supposed to ask you about arrest records. And certainly if somebody is interviewed and they're asked that question, they should march over to the Illinois Department of Human Rights and file a complaint. Is that the ban the box law? Or? No, that's separate. So we have, we have the Illinois Human Rights Act that tells employers you, 
you cannot make an employment decision based on an arrest record, and you're not supposed to ask people whether or not they've ever been arrested for a crime. Until? You can you can ask people if they've been convicted of a crime. Okay. Then we have ban the box, which is a law that went into effect. I want to say going on two two or three years ago, and what ban the box says, and it applies here in Illinois to both public and private employers, mm -hmm. is in most, but not in all instances, the typical example would be you, you apply for a job at Target. Target cannot ask you whether or not you've been convicted of a crime on the job application. Okay. So what ban the box does is it moves the, the conversation about do you have a background to later on in the employment practice with the hope that if you get in, you have an interview, the employer likes you, that once they find out that you have a background, they won't be so ready to discard you because they've already gotten to know you and they liked you enough to offer you a job, but that doesn't keep them from still making that decision. So what ban the box doesn't do, it doesn't prohibit employers from doing background checks. Okay. And it doesn't prohibit employers from choosing not to hire somebody once they discover you have a background. All right. But what it does is it gets, the theory is it gets you in the door and have that face-to-face -face interview that you probably wouldn't have had the chance to get if they knew right up front that you had a background. Would you have any independent knowledge of whether that's been effective? Um, any statistics from anybody? It, it, I'll say it this way, um, uh, you know, uh, fast food, uh, grocery stores, um, there's a lot more people that uh, my sense is uh, by the types of tattoos they have that they were perhaps incarcerated or had a criminal background. And, uh, you know, depending on who you talk to, some people think ban the box laws do what they hoped it would do. And then you have other people saying that they think that ban the box laws are doing the opposite, particularly with, with respect to people of color. Okay. Um, as far as juveniles, you commit a crime before you're 18. Uh, how is that affected by any of this process, or is it necessary even um, when you're trying to, ex is it necessary to expunge or seal when you're you commit some crimes as a juvenile? So up until recently, you were a juvenile until you turned age 17. That age has been raised now to 18. Okay. So now today, when you get arrested and you're 17, you're going to be treated as a juvenile as opposed to an adult. Uh, or if I, you're tried as an adult when you're a juvenile still, I, in that scenario. So the important thing to know is that there is a process to expunge a juvenile record. Okay. We only talk about expunging a juvenile record because by operation of law, juvenile records are sealed. And what I mean by that is that juvenile records here in Illinois are not public records. So I can't, in theory, go to the juvenile court and look up somebody's record. All right. Because I'm not an employee of the court, and it's not my record. Okay. Speaking of not being your own record, we're in the day and age of identity theft. My identity is stolen. Somebody uses it. My name gets, you know, indicted. They have that person. My name's indicted. And in this day and age of information, storage of information, and state and federal, um, what are one's options in, in, in that scenario where somebody steals your identity, they've got your ID, they give their name or your name, and you're convicted? So sadly, um, sometimes people don't know their identity has been stolen until they go and apply for a job and a background check comes back and there's something on it that clearly isn't theirs. Um, Hopefully that's not how you find out that your background's been stolen, but there is a process, there is a form, in fact, a petition for identity theft that you would um, fill out and file with the court 
to, to show the court that this case is not yours. Typically, the typical scenario of identity theft is a sibling steals his or her brother or sister's identity or a relative. Every once in a while it's a friend, but usually it's somebody you know and you may or may not have some idea that they have used your name when they've been arrested. Okay. But it is something that can easily be resolved, but you have to know that it's happened. Okay. I have a question relating to uh, the number of clemency petitions that are pre uh, currently being granted by Governor Rahner versus Governor Quinn. Um, in what I read and understand, Governor Quinn roughly granted 33 percent. Would that be approximate? Yes. And Governor Rahner is granting what percent approximately? Um, based on my most re recent calculation, 5 percent. Okay. It and was as low as 4 percent, but now we're up to 5. Okay, it's an improvement. So, um, and the Prison Review Board members that make those recommendations were uh, appointed prior still Quinn because they're in their, their term and I would assume that they're making at least a 33 percent recommendation say previously with Quinn and if they're maintaining that percentage so uh, a lower amount are being granted clemency. Well just so people understand the, the way clemency works in here in Illinois is we, we have a, an agency called the Illinois Prison Review Board and they sort of serve as the administrative arm of the clemency process. Uh, it's with the Prisoner Review Board that you file your petition for clemency. They hold public hearings uh, to en enable petitioners to come and face to face have a conversation about why they're eligible for clemency. And then at the end of the day, the board members make a confidential recommendation. So they vote and then pass along a confidential recommendation to the governor along with the clemency petition. But the final decision does rest with the governor. So that confidential recommendation is not binding. But usually if they make the recommendation for yes, the governor may go with it. But if they make a re recommendation no, is it fair to say that the governor is more likely not to go with that? That's certainly the rule of thumb. I, I had a case uh, where my client um, basically had a meltdown at the hearing. Oh, geez. And um, I pretty much knew then and there that she wasn't going to get clemency. The board wasn't going to grant her clemency. You know, the, the board wasn't going to recommend clemency for her. And I eventually advised her to withdraw her petition. Okay. And, you know, start over. But yes, so the rule of thumb is if you walk out of that hearing, and say, I don't think that went well. I certainly will not expect a letter telling me my client is, is going to receive clemency. Um, because these recommendations are confidential, however, we don't know how often the governor disagrees with the recommendation. Okay. Well, thank you, Ina Silverglide, for your, your uh, information. and. Um, We'll continue again on another session with Ms. Silverglide on, on further discussions on executive clemency, uh, sealing your records today. Thanks. Thank you.